everybody. Welcome to those of you who are joining us right now. Um, we're going to let it go for a couple of minutes uh, until we get uh, all the participants in place, and then I'll give you some updates. Hey Jeff, while we're waiting, can you put the smug mug 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 link in the Q and A box or the chat yeah, box I'll, so I can direct people to it? I'll, okay, I'll do that. Sure. Okay. Hi, welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Um, just hang tight for a few minutes. Um, we're waiting until we sort of stabilize in terms of number of attendees, and then we will go ahead and start. All righty, we seem to be stabilizing in terms of number of participants. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. As a reminder, we are being recorded. Um, and uh, this is a webinar for students, staff and faculty um, in the University of Washington School of, School of Public Health. Um, which it reminds me to, uh, which I forgot to say last week, that in response to requests that we got from you guys, um, Elazar Mercado, who's our, one of our fabulous comms team members, um, has developed these lovely backgrounds for us that um, have School of Public Health um, signage on them. So uh, if you look in the chat box, Jeff Hodgson has um, provided the link where you can look, download this, this one. We're very purple today. I'm wearing purple, background is purple. Um, but there's also super cute ones like one with stubs and, and cherry blossoms and all sorts of great stuff. So check them out um, and feel free to use them. Um, someone is asking whether there's a way to call in instead of watching online. And the answer is yes, there are Zoom call in numbers and I'm going to ask Jashana to post in the chat box um, what the call-in number is in case people just want to do the audio portion of this and not do the visual portion of it. Um, I guess you also could just turn off the video part of your computer, but if you need to use the phone line, that's absolutely an option. Okay. so. Um, for those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Hillary Godwin, Dean of the School of Public Health. Um, and as a reminder, th this webinar um, is designed for our internal audience. We're happy to have other people join us, but the guidance that I'm providing in terms of policies and updates is um, specifically for folks who have primary appointments in our school. So if you're from a, your primary appointments in a different school or a different organization, um, then you should check with your supervisor there to find out what um, the policies are for you. Um, in these webinars, we don't typically use the chat box, um, although we're using it right now to post information that's just going to stay there for the entire webinar, like the Zoom background uh, link, um, and hopefully soon the phone number. Um, if people want to call in. Um, but if you have questions to ask, 
we ask that you post them in the Q&A box. Um, and Jashana then manages those and she'll move the questions out as they're answered. Um, she did fix it. Apparently we were having a problem last week where people weren't able to see each other's questions and that should be fixed this week. But if it's not, let us know and we will work on it. Um, okay, so uh, as has been the case for previous webinars, the basic format that we're going to use is um, I'm going to give you some updates, including introducing our panelists for today. Um, then I'm going to introduce our main panelists, and then um, we'll answer questions at the end and have open Q&A um, in case people have questions. And we might get really exciting and actually try and figure out how to do, like, letting you unmute your phone. Um, but so stay tuned. We'll see how, how hectic things get. Um, so our fabulous guest panelist today, today is Betty Beckmeyer, who's the director of the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice a professor of nursing and an adjunct professor of health services. Betty will discuss work that the Northwest Center is doing in, with the practice community on COVID-19 activities. Um, so uh, I'll come back and give her a more detailed introduction in, in a little bit, but um, our other panelists for today are Janet Baseman, um, who you've heard from before, our Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and a professor of epidemiology, Stephanie Farquhar, who's our Acting Associate Dean for Education, and a clinical professor at Health Services and DEOHS, and Lisa Manhart, who's the Associate Dean for Research and a professor of epidemiology. And they're my backup team, just in case you guys ask hard questions uh, that I need help answering. Okay, so first starting with the brief overview and general update. Huh. Interesting. Someone says they have logged on twice and only see a black screen. Uh, I've seen comments from other people that they can see what I'm talking about. So my guess is to that person, try clicking up in the um, speaker view button up on the top and make sh try toggling that. Um, but other than that, I, I don't have any huge words of wisdom there. Okay, so general update. Um, positive news continuing here in Washington State. Um, our individuals and our communities are doing a great job with physical distancing. And it now appears that we have passed the peak of the pandemic, not only here, but in many other parts of the country as well, including uh, New York City and New York State, uh, which as many of you know, has been hit super hard. And our um, thoughts and condolences go out to um, family and friends who are from that region and from other really hard hit regions of the country um, who have um, really been struggling with and with this in the last week or two. Um, big question that I keep getting from people, and I'm sure you probably get too, is when can we go back to normal? Um, so we'll get back to that in a minute, but let me uh, provide you with a little bit of context in terms of what we're seeing. So um, one is that the Institute for Disease Modeling, which is here um, in the Puget Sound region, they're located in Bellevue, um, issued a new report noting that the infection rate has continued to drop considerably in King, Snohomish, and Pierce counties. Uh, word has it that IHME is also going to be um, doing a big update to their COVID-19 site today. Um, so I um, encourage everyone to check that out later. Um, from the Institute for Disease Modeling uh, report, they report that instead of each infected person passing the virus on to close to three people, um, as was happening early in the, and the epidemic in our region, um, that number may now have dropped to fewer than one, um, according to the estimates. This is what we call the effective reproduction number. Um, and it's a sign that the pandemic um, is declining and uh, that our physical distancing is measures are working and um, that's all super awesome. That being said, um, the Institute for Disease Modeling report noted, and we hear this consistently from our friends and colleagues in public health practice, that the region continues to be in a precarious state, and that it's really important to maintain social distancing to prevent rebound transmission. Um, I have a note from Jeff saying that he will post the report on our website, and um, apparently there's, a, a, I haven't seen it yet, but great link in um, article in the Seattle Times as well. Other trends this week. Um, 
worldwide. This week we passed uh, the grim mark of more than 2 million total confirmed cases with global deaths surpassing 132,000. Um, the number of new cases reported each day has started to go down, which is great um, in several of the hardest hit countries, but we're likely going to see bumps um, where cases begin to increase again, when society start transitioning um, and lifting up some of the social most stringent social restrictions. Um, and we see um, resurgence of, we expect to see resurgence of the, the virus under those conditions. Nationally in the United States, we now have more than 600,000 cases and about 26,000 deaths. Um, again, I, if you guys haven't checked out IHME's COVID-19 um, page, which is a, a tremendous resource, I highly recommend that you do that. Um, it's a really great way to see sort of how we're tracking in real time because they, they update with um, new data regularly. Um, that model predicts that in the United States nationally that peak daily deaths occurred on Monday, the 13th. Um, and at this point, the current projection is that we'll see about uh, 68,000 total deaths in the United States. This is slightly higher than the projections from last week, although uh, I'd say we'll see what, what they say um, when they update their models uh, later today, um, because um, rumor is that there's good news coming out of there. Um, in Washington State, Washington is now has narrow, now had nearly 11,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19, including um, 541 fatalities. The total number of tests to date in Washington State is over 122,000, um, with a positive rate uh, of 8.7%. Um, positive cases have fallen steadily um, over the last two weeks, um, increasing our confidence that we really are past the peak of the curve. Um, and uh, we're looking towards um, a projections currently that, um, that hopefully deaths in Washington State should reach zero uh, somewhere in early May or to mid-May, according to the IHME model. Um, big news this week, the governors of Washington, California, and Oregon announced that they have agreed to coordinate their plans to reopen their economies of, for each of our states um, and to figure out how to get us back to work. Um, same thing happened with a group of governors in the Northeast as well. Um, the last that we had sort of heard was that we were on um, stay home, stay healthy until May 4th, um, but it's not clear whether or not um, that will need to be postponed. Um, you know, we expect lots of news coming out about this, um, uh, both for us here locally, the West Coast, and then from different jurisdictions as well. Um, but what we're, the messaging that we're hearing from Governor Inslee's office and from Public Health Seattle and King County is that we would likely see some sort of phase out of the restrictions um, that were phased in earlier in the epidemic. Um, and uh, so keep your eyes posted for that. And obviously we'll be providing updates as well in terms of what that means for us at the University of Washington. Um, so factors that will be considered and deciding um, which restrictions to lift include um, what the rate of infections and fatalities are for us. Um, the infection rate per capita, the number of hospitalizations, the percentage of positive tests, and also our ability to be able to monitor um, who in our region is positive, so the, our testing capacity, and our ability to um, follow up on those positive results um, during doing um, case contact tracing. So what you should expect to see um, for in the upcoming weeks, and I saw some announcements from the um, Seattle Times today about this, is um, really a, a call for a great increase in the number of tests that are conducted um, and also um, big efforts to expand our past 
capacity to do contact tracing. Um, this is going to require the work of a lot of people, uh, like our SEAL team, um, but others as well. Um, and um, hope, we're hoping that these measures will work and buy us some time. Um, and, uh, you know, that we then will have to keep monitoring the situation um, and perhaps have to reimpose um, some of the restrictions if case loads get too high in the future. Um, because uh, we're still a long way from having any kind of herd immunity or being out of the woods until we're able to get um, a vaccine in place. Um, that being said, with all of those things, I think it's important to take a moment to celebrate that um, we have a great governor here in the state of Washington and amazing public health practice um, folks and leadership both the boots on the ground who are doing all the hard work of contact tracing and uh, dealing with the epidemic, our amazing medical care professionals who are um, helping people who are, who are ill, um, and uh, just outstanding leadership that is helping to shape the direction um, that the governor is taking um, so that the decisions that he's making are evidence-based um, and um, based on sound um, public health guidance. So we're really grateful for that. Transitioning to news a little bit closer to home, um, we have a little bit of an update on our new building timeline. So um, not surprisingly, given um, what's been going on with the COVID-19 outbreak, um, there are some delays um, in construction at the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health. Um, the crews have been working at about 75% capacity, and our future furniture vendor, Herman Miller, is working at about 30% capacity. Um, so our best guess is that means that the building, uh, the move in for the building will be delayed by about a month. Um, if that is the case, that would mean completion in July. A furniture uh, furniture deliveries and, uh, and move into their locations in August, and people would move in in September. Um, but obviously, we'll be keeping you posted on, on what happens with that, and a lot of that has to do with um, things that are beyond our control. Um, I got one question about um, what are we expecting for commencement? Um, so commencement ceremonies, um, as you know from last week's announcement, um, the big UW Central Commencement will be online this year. Um, and we're looking to do something similar for the annual SPH graduation celebration. Um, we don't yet have details about how we're going to be handling um, the individual um, departmental graduations. Um, so keep, keep your eyes peeled for notice about that. Um, they do have some mechanisms where we can have separate little online ceremonies. Um, someone asked me whether it's possible to consider a postponed graduation for the School of Public Health. And the answer to that is not a postponed in-person one. So we are going to celebrate online at the regular time. Um, we, everyone who is graduating this year also is invited to come back to next year's ceremony in person. If we get a large enough turnout next year of people from this year, the ceremony will be separate. Um, and if we just get a relatively small number, then it will be combined with next year's graduating class. Um, and that's for the campus as a whole. Um, okay. Um, the same thing is true for the school's annual excellence awards, uh, which honors outstanding students, staff, and faculty. Um, we're going ahead with that process. Um, I, accepting nominations, making the awards, which will be um, announced next month. Um, but we're going to do the celebration in some online format and, and stay tuned. Who knows? It'll be something great um, and something to look forward to. Um, also, the first of the MPH practicum symposiums kicked off this week and will continue, continue on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next few weeks. Um, Strategic planning has not been affected at this point, um, at least in terms of the timeline. The committees and consultants have been working on the key result areas. Um, they're continuing to meet this week and finalize their work. 
Um, and an all-school meeting will, via Zoom will be held in a couple of weeks for your input, so stay tuned on that. Um, I did want to give people a heads up about some of the um, information that's being um, passed down to us um, from Central Campus about uh, financial uncertainties and um, how those affect hiring practices. So um, as everyone is abundantly aware, um, the financial markets are pretty unstable right now. In addition, both the state and federal government have massive um, expenditures involved in COVID response um, that uh, will, are already starting to have implications for other um, more routine expenditures. We've seen Governor Inslee um, um, vetoing um, some of the programs that had been um, recommended by the legislature um, in order to um, cut down on expenses. He was very clear in saying that those programs were things that he thought were great and highly valued. Uh, it's just that he's tried to be fiscally responsible. Um, very few of those to date have been um, ones for us here at the University of Washington, um, but we have received guidance from the state to say that we should expect to see some budget cuts and that we should plan accordingly. Um, in response to um, the changing world around us and also um, indications from the state um, that we might expect budget cuts, uh, the provost and the president have um, enacted what they're referred to as a period of restricted hiring practices. Um, this is a little different than a hiring freeze. So a hiring freeze is no hiring. Um, and a lot of other institutions had announced hiring freezes and then said, but we'll make exceptions. Um, and we instead have a period of restricted hiring where we acknowledge that we will, we will continue to do some hiring of both faculty and staff um, during this period. Um, but the, for the faculty positions, we're now required for any offers that had not been made before April 10th, we're required to get pre-approval from the provost for each specific offer before it's extended even verbally. And then uh, we're, we are working on formulating a hiring plan for the school for next year, um, but have now gotten um, explicit written instructions from the provost um, that that hiring should be significantly scaled back um, from what we might have been planning to do um, prior to COVID-19 and that, um, that we need to make sure that we're justifying the hires that we do in terms of meeting um, critical needs. Um, so, and then for staff, um, likewise, um, the, the provost has asked us to, uh, so there we don't need to get approvals for every single um, hire that we're doing, but he's asked at the dean's level that each of the deans review hires um, before offers are made for new, new staff positions um, and that we really focus on, use, on using the criteria that it's something that's really essential to our core mission, either COVID-19 response or um, in the case of staff, either something related to COVID-19 response or, or a function that's really critical to us um, maintaining um, operations during this period. So I wanted people to be aware of that because I'm guessing, you know, news of it has sort of been rippling out. Um, when we get to the Q&A section, I'm happy to answer questions about sort of what is that looking like for us, um, but wanted to make sure that we're communicating clearly to everyone in the community um, that we're, we are in this period of sort of um, trying not to take on new obligations in a period where there's a lot of financial uncertainty other than ones that are really core to our mission and values um, and our ability to make it through this process um, and that some of the things that um, we might have been hoping to do, we may need to delay for a year or two um, until we're sure that the economy has, has stabilized. Okay, so with that, let me introduce Betty Beckmeyer. So uh, Betty, um, who hopefully we'll turn on her, her video in just a second. Oh, you see her, she's emerging, there she is, hi. Um, so hopefully all you guys know Betty. Betty is the director of the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice. I have to say like, Betty, love you. Um, she, like when I first arrived, which now was like, 
almost a year, more than a year and a half ago. Um, Betty, like uh, one of the first things we did was she was like, I got to take you down to Washington State Department of Health and introduce you to our practice partners. And we had an awesome field trip. And it just like really kicked off my, you know, introduction to not just the school, but our surrounding community in a really lovely way. Um, I'm eternally grateful to you for that and also for all the great work that you do um, providing continuing education for our workforce around the region, um, helping us, you know, figure out what kind of needs um, there are in terms of training for our students and totally awesome practice-oriented research in the school. So with that, Betty, I'm gonna let you tell us a little bit about what the Northwest Center has been doing in terms of uh, COVID response. All right, great. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute and perhaps even turn off my camera. Okay, and hopefully you all can hear me. Um, and I can, I can assure you, Hillary, that, that um, those early visits when you arrived were not forgotten. People in our, our practice, it meant a lot to our practice partners too. They remember that very, very fondly and that stuck with them. So thank you very much. So, um, so yes, I'm coming here from the um, Northwest Center for Public Health Practice. That tower is where we typically belong, although we, like you, are now spread around the city. But um, hopefully you guys are familiar with the uh, Northwest Center for Public Health Practice. But a quick little thumbnail background sketch is, is we're really an outward facing unit of the, of the University of Washington. We are, we're really uh, facing and working entirely with public health practice. And our job is really about linking academia um, with the public health practice community. Uh, this year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary and, and I love parties myself, and we were gonna have a great big awesome one. We had wonderful plans, but like so much else, it, they kind of went down the tubes. And so just know that we have been around for 30 years um, and, uh, and really are, are focused on service to the, to the Northwest states. Um, and in particular, Washington, where our home is, but, um, but also Alaska, Washington, Alaska, Oregon, Idaho, um, and on nationally. The, the three sort of main uh, pillars of work that we, we say we do are around workforce development and uh, practice-based research. And um, we do a lot of evaluation work for and with our uh, public health practice partners. Um, so we've, we also have a long history as a preparedness and emergency response research center. Um, those started to be funded in, in and around something like uh, 2000 or 2001. Um, and for as long as those were funded at the, by, the, by the feds, we were one. So up until uh, um, just a few years ago. So we have a long history in um, uh, preparedness related research and training, et cetera, as well. I want to make it clear though that the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice is not um, just about me. It is really an extremely talented, uh, much bigger team of, of expertise. We've got um, amazing faculty affiliated with the center, several numerous um, amazing faculty and a long history of them. We've got staff with um, um, very deep expertise in evaluation, instructional design, e-learning, um, public health practice and outreach expertise, um, project management, graphic and web design, communications, technology. So as I talk today, please know that I'm representing a very rich group of teammates, metaphorically behind me, although not really behind me today. Um, but uh, a major part of what we do is, as I said, this linkage between practice and academia. So the more um, in academia, the more uh, academic folks get excited about public health practice, the more excited we get. Um, we love that. We love making those connections. So, and for me also, uh, Hillary mentioned I'm faculty also in the School of Nursing, so that means also making those similar kind of connections and generating that excitement in the School of Nursing and other schools around campus. Um, so why, so this linkage is especially important in times like right now. And we've never, frankly, had a time quite like right now. Um, and it's, so that's especially important in emergencies. I think of it as, um, as our, our job always is to advance and support public health practice. 
And they need that now more than ever. So I'm very grateful for the long history we have of, of having those deep and, and broad uh, relationships and understanding of our partners, et cetera. Because I, I think of it a little bit as um, if you have a, a friend in crisis or a friend who, who had a family member recently die, it's not that helpful to call them up and say, hey, if you need anything, just let me know. When, you, when we do that, we give them another job to do and they don't really need another job to do. They're, they're in crisis. But when you know that friend, when you know their needs and interests um, and you know them well, you can, you can say, hey, I'm bringing over your favorite casserole. Um, you know, no ifs and ifs or ands about it. Or you say, I'm babysitting your um, kids on Friday night. You're gonna, you're gonna go out. Well, maybe not today, but maybe not these days, but anyway, but you get my, my meaning, I think that, um, that you share the, the, you share the things you know they could use, that they would need, they would want. And that's, that's sort of how we're, that's how we're thinking about that right now. Um, leveraging our, our depth of experience and understanding and knowledge and years of, of assessment, et cetera, of uh, public health practice um, uh, field in our, in our region so that we can be responsive we can leverage that knowledge and those relationships now to help them get what they need, um, uh, steer resources to them that they'll want, and do this as much as possible without bugging them. So right now, that's what we're doing. We're, we're leveraging um, our knowledge of practice and these relationships and still getting a sense of their, their needs. We do reach out to them and they to us but we try to do it with the lightest touch without bugging them because they, they are extremely, extremely stretched and busy and we um, are very, very sensitive to that. Um, we, the same with potential research ideas. Um, we have many and probably you do too, but, um, but it's, it's clearly been not helpful or it's, it's apparent that it's not helpful to do much and to plant many research ideas on practice during a crisis. If it's not helpful today, they're likely not interested. So we're always thinking ahead, like what's, the, what's the, something that sort of helps lay the tracks for the train um, that they're in right now. Um, it's hard for them to think about that, those train tracks any further than, than their current um, location, but we're helping to sort of think beyond um, what would be helpful and supportive. And they have seemed to be appreciative of that. Um, so um, some of the things we're doing with our partners, uh, we're doing lots of listening, uh, listening all the time. And we have, we, uh, we don't want to bug them at the same time. We are in pretty frequent communication um, with folks either by email or, or um, telephone, et cetera and um, meeting up with folks and some and often they're reaching out to us so things they're saying that they need you know frankly right now they they talk about just really needing bodies they need more capacity so we've been looking at ways to um, leverage students and um, looking at the um, Janet Baseman SEAL team and and Hendrika Maischke is working with a um, uh, uh, team of her uh, undergraduate public health students um, looking at linking up other students to specific projects. Um, so these are things we can try to help make happen right now without um, additional funding. It's a win-win. Students are very, many students are just very, very eager to be, um, to, to help be a part of the solution here. So that's been sort of really wonderful. Um, some work, um, an example of this is as I mentioned, Henrika Maischke, she's working with our partners at the Washington State Department of Health who have been really um, asking for help in terms of how to reach limited English proficiency um, communities around the, around the state with communication and messaging around um, COVID-19. They're, they're really worried that these, um, some of these communities are got, not getting the information they need. So um, she's working with her students. We've been working on a survey that her students will help help launch and carry out and collect some of these some collect information for our Washington State Department of Health to help um, guide communications and things. So it's a real um, kind of collaborative relationship. 
other things we're doing is um, looking at are there some quick virtual trainings we uh, folks need that we can be developing at the Northwest Center. Um, some of you may know we have this uh, regular um, once a month series called uh, Hot Topics in Practice. Hopefully you're familiar with that. It's very popular. Your own Dean Godwin has been featured in the, in the recent past, but um, we've been shaping those more recently around um, COVID-19 related um, response topics, especially those that, that depict learnings and best practices here in Washington that we know um, people around the region are very, and nationally, are very, very eager to um, find out what we've been doing and what's been working. So we've been um, working hard on that and also working hard on figuring out how to share learnings um, from within Washington and from Public Health Seattle King County that the rest of the country is, is very eager to know what we did, how we did it, what worked, what didn't work. Um, we get people asking us those questions from outside the state, and we are e eagerly figuring out how to help link people up with that information. Um, we're also regularly connecting with um, the practice-based research um, faculty within the um, School of Public Health in particular. Some of those folks are Janet Baseman, Hendrika Maischke, Nicole Errett, and Turner. Um, and a number of us, uh, Barbara Baquero, um, who, who have done, been doing work with health departments, um, Peggy Hannon and others, um, and linking up kind of what we know about what the practice needs are and what are um, relevant uh, research questions that we can tee up that represent a wish list for practice, that we can look for resources around, et cetera. We really want um, to be thoughtful about what we can do that's going to help advance practice. Other things we're doing too is, is the Northwest Center had our own um, work plan established for the year, just like the school did around um, teaching and courses, et cetera. And so much like the school is needing to adapt, so are we needing to adapt. So we're looking at some of our own things we've been doing, what needs to be what could be put on hold while we um, uh, allocate resources a little differently. We have some things um, like going on this year, we're, we're almost in the middle of our, um, the launch of our first public health primary care leadership institute. It's about bringing public health and primary care um, sectors together for a, a year long cohort program um, that really helps them more effectively integrate their work across these sectors, public health and primary care. Well, if, if this experience hasn't taught us that this is more important than ever, then I don't know what will. Um, but at the same time, the folks involved in this Leadership Institute are, are really busy right now. And so we're having to look at how to modify um, that cohort program for the year at the same time that these um, the scholars in this program right now are very excited about what they're learning, what they need to learn, and how relevant it is. Um, so um, some other things we're doing, we, we encourage you to look at, to visit our um, website. The, we've been putting our resource page um, on the uh, front of our um, website where you'll find um, coronavirus training resources that we've pulled together from things we've done over the years that are very relevant. Um, there, there's a lot there in terms of risk communication, public health law, outbreak investigation, um, all sorts of things that are relevant um, to, to um, current events. You'll also find our hot topics and practice webinars, so maybe there's recent ones we've done that are um, that that are that I mentioned that relate to the outbreak. Um, there's other things we've put there. Here's another link to um, our partners and related um, trainings and resources that they've compiled. Um, we're also um, trying to be responsive to the media. Frankly, there's no time like the present to make a case for how important public health uh, practice and public health systems are. 
um, to the, the nation's health, to reducing disparities, to addressing health inequities. So we don't want to um, miss that opportunity. Um, we've linked a couple of things here in terms of uh, op-ed that basically says as much um, that, that I was able to publish. And then um, other, we've had many other media requests um, and been um, working through those. And you would be surprised to hear um, there's, um, as uh, Congress works through legislation and develops how they're gonna, how they're gonna fund what with some of this um, money that's been allocated, there's many, many urgent messages we're getting from uh, folks at the national level and policymakers who want to know about um, how they should uh, develop this or that piece around the public health workforce or how much would it cost for how many of these kinds of people or what's the um uh, what's the ratio of disease investigators should we have per capita for surge um uh, for uh surge response in a community etc and how much would that cost these questions are very very hard to answer but we um, people like myself and, and colleagues, et cetera, we're, we're doing our best to be responsive to these because this is our opportunity um, to really uh, help build um, a public health workforce and um, related evidence that we've not had much, we've, we've struggled to do in recent years. Um, even um, recent, we're working with um, a recent call for uh, e emails around pushing out a loan repayment program proposed for, for graduates from um, schools of public health, schools of nursing, elsewhere, to help um, provide loan repayment for, for graduates who go into working at a um, local health department. So uh, if, if something like that should ever go through, we're, we're all, we are super behind pushing something like that and um, would cross our fingers that something like that gets written into upcoming legislation. So all of that stuff is going on behind the scenes and it's all um, hurry, 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 frankly. Um, there's plenty of things we'd like to do more of. Uh, we've got other types of trainings we'd like to build that, that um, we're hearing about from folks. Um, there's other special webinars we've been um, talking about uh, with uh, some of our partners and uh, colleagues here at the University of Washington. We'd really like to um, disseminate some of the lessons learned from here in Seattle and Washington. We know people are very, very eager uh, for that kind of information. Um, and then, so we're looking for more resources for some of these things and doing a lot of work around that area and working with um, uh, the Population Health Initiative as well around some of these things. and. The, um, Dean Godwin's office, et cetera, as well as you know, a lot of external funders. We'll need more time too to do some of the bigger things we'd like to do around um, um, developing communities of practice, um, revising existing materials so that there's um, over the, more over the long term, there's people have resources that they can use then to really build up um, a workforce that can deal with the more long term response that will be that we've got ahead of us here. Um, I think that's just about it. Uh, there's lots going on. We are, um, we are not bored at all at the Northwest <laughs> Center. And, um, and frankly, I can't, I, just as a parting thought, I just can't say enough about how strongly I feel or we feel at the uh, Northwest Center that, that it's really um, uh, the responsibility is on us, all of us, um, to make the most of this, what is a terrible, terrible crisis. Um, and uh, the fact of the matter is, is it's here, but um, how can we make the most of it to really assure a healthier future and a stronger uh, public health system um, that, that results, um, that comes as a result of this at least. So uh, thank you very much, I'll pass it back and um, take questions later or however you want to handle it. Okay. 
Thank, thanks, Betty. Um, I'm so I'm looking at the questions and I haven't seen any that are specific to Betty. Um, so I'm going to put a call out that if the, if you have specific questions for Betty, can you just write question for Betty? Um, perhaps a good transition as one of the questions that might have been for Betty, um, but I think is actually for Janet would provide us with a nice transition into uh, Janet providing updates. So Janet, I'll read this question to you and then you can answer it and then provide your own update. And, and if we see questions pop up for Betty, we'll, we'll come back to them. Okay, so the question is, uh, this person says, I'm an EMPH student and I've been eager to help in this situation by donating my skills and my time. I speak other languages and have a diverse skill set. However, I haven't been able to find opportunities to help. I filled in the UW SCH volunteer survey some weeks ago, but I haven't heard anything back. Have you got suggestions on which doors shall I knock on in order to offer my help in this time where help and extra hands are needed? Janet. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to start by echoing a point that Betty just made um which is that like about the friend who you know <laughs> like if you know what kind of casserole they like oh like that's very helpful so um like it's really i think it's really hard for people to feel like they're sitting on their hands and like not able to contribute meaningfully but one of the things that i've said um like several times just to various people i probably haven't said it here yet is that um the health departments may not be able to absorb all of our um amazing awesome intentions and goodwill right now um just because you know they're dealing with the stuff that's like right in their face all the time like ah oh, you know it's kind of like um so i think under normal circumstances they would be so thrilled to have um so many people um wanting to help out it's just like really hard to make to make that specific thing happen so that's kind of a general comment um but your question relates to to my uh, main update today which is that we've had a request from public health seattle and king county it came in last week uh for us to help with uh the stand up of a pilot contact tracing uh effort and the way uh, we have been working to staff that request is through the School of Public Health volunteer survey that it sounds like you filled out. Um, the way we're we're going through that process is um, is we have a database uh, that has all of the information that anybody who filled out the survey put in about their skills and also their availability and we're um, filtering the data, you know, the database in order to um, find, you know, the right people to target based on that information. So um, I think I reached out to close to 200 people in the database um, with this particular request. And if you did not get that, uh, it, it may be because um, you had said that you weren't immediately available or that the number of hours you had said you were available didn't match what they were um what they were asking for but you're welcome to send me an email just to me um and you know like tell me about um your skills so that we can make sure that you're uh, represented correctly in the database and if your availability has changed um like you can always uh, always reach out to me um so uh right so uh we are gonna have about 40 of our uh people uh starting to help out at king county uh this weekend with this uh pilot contact tracing initiative which is um, which is really exciting the other thing i just wanted to say before i pass it off to anybody else is it's related to betty's presentation and i just wanted to do um just a quick little shout out uh because the preparedness and emergency response research center that Betty described. Um, I was one of the PIs of that uh, for all of the years. Um, it was around and it was an amazing um, group of both practice and um, academic, you know, both practice and academic PIs. 
And it was just like a, a, a great, um, great work that we were doing together. And, and I'm really excited um, to continue doing that work with everybody um, as, things, as things move forward. And the other thing I just wanted to mention about the Northwest Center, uh, especially to all of you students out there, um, it was just a little tiny story uh, that when I was in PhD school uh, in the Department of Epidemiology, and I was really keen to kind of, you know, find a way to pivot my work toward a more practice, you know, oriented um, relevance, I guess. Um, the very first step I took in my journey was to go to the faculty at the Northwest Center. And all those years ago, um, Jim Gale hired me as a research assistant when I was still in school. Um, and I worked on a project um, to look at epidemiology competency development for the practice workforce. And we wrote a paper about it. And that was literally my very first step um, on my way to kind of having this balance uh, between a research and practice career. And that's just, you know, to encourage you, if any of you um, are feeling like you're seeking out those types of opportunities and connections, um, you can always reach out to me, but you can also reach out to Betty. And the Northwest Center is, is just an amazing resource and its whole purpose is to make those connections. So I just wanted to mention that. That's it for me, Hillary. Okay, thanks, Janet. And yes, just to echo what Janet was saying, um, you know, it is really hard to like, be like, I have this great skill, I wanna help. Um, and Janet does also have to remind me periodically too, is like, they don't have the bandwidth for like, what that thing that you're, that I'm particularly passionate about that day. Like I need to keep quit bugging them. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the other thing that Janet mentioned that really like has been a clear message consistently to me that, and she mentioned that I wanna reiterate, is that frequently when she does get requests from them, they're looking for people who can commit significant, significant chunks of time, um, not just like today, but like, you know, like they're looking for people who can work 40 hours a week for like a couple of weeks. Um, and that's not most of our people who are willing to volunteer don't have that kind of capacity. Um, so that's been a big reason. If you haven't heard, it, it could be a big reason why you might not have heard. Um, and if your situation has changed, definitely um, let her know. And that's just because it, it, you know, like as we all, all of us who have supervised people know, it's a big heavy lift to take take on new people that you're supervising. And so they, for them, it's just too overwhelming to have a bunch of people doing a little bit of time. They really need people. They've been very consistent in messaging that um, they need people who can devote big chunks of time over a significant um, timeline. Um, okay, uh, we got a question for Betty. So Betty, Anjali um, says for Betty, yeah. It's been great to have been invited to be a part of the Northwest Center and DOH's Community Engagement Task Force. The SCH undergrad seniors and honors program are doing projects for DOH as well around language access and access for PPL living with, uh, oh, for people, <laughs> PPL, um, people living with disabilities. So I, I don't think there was a question there. It was just a no, yes, Anjali, forgive me. I, you know, this is the danger of naming people because then you forget critical, critical people. So Anjali, thank you very, very much um, for bringing this up. Um, the uh, Anjali and uh, Sarah McKenzie too from the, with the undergrad program have been awesome. Anjali has also mobilized a whole army of honor students, just as she described, and is doing amazing, amazing stuff with them. Um, also around a specific ask from DOH around um, more effectively reaching um, uh, some of these more marginalized communities. So thank you, Anjali, forgive me for, for leaving that out. And I would add, um, Hillary, to your, your point about really linking up amazing students with opportunities. Um, part of what's making it really possible with a um, few opportunities I described is that it's really kind of the faculty person um, doing some heavy lifting there. The, the instructor for a course, and, and in this case, Anjali is describing, she's, she is the instructor for a course who's really leaning in and, um, and going, um, really going the extra mile in terms of making this be able to happen for 
these students and also having it being really relevant for her practice partners. So, um, and that makes it more possible for us to sort of help make things like that happen when we can identify those kinds of opportunities and have the faculty person kind of doing that heavy lifting instead of a, you know, putting it, having it to be on a, um, somebody in practice who's already overwhelmed. Thank you, Anjali. Yes. Okay. Um, transitioning, Stephanie, um, do you have an update for us on stuff related to education and classes? Sure. Hello. Hello, Betty. Um, I was just going to say that when I was on the faculty, I was in Portland, Oregon, of all places, we frequently talked about Betty in the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice. We had university partners and the health departments and other community-based organizations that were always looking north of I-5 um, to the center as, as a great model that blended all of these different worlds. So great. thank Thanks. you for that. Um, so I'm happy to report that uh, this spring term, we've been keeping an eye on enrollment and um, sort of hardship withdrawals. Um, and student enrollment spring term is actually higher than it was a year ago. And in fact, I've been told that we think this is an all-time high for the School of Public Health. So we had um, around 1,700 students um, after the official 10-day census was taken, which I believe was last Friday. And that was up from about 1,600 a year ago in 2019. Um, so the difference, there are a number of reasons for this difference, but it's largely due to the new undergraduate major in food systems, nutrition, and health. And the program now in its second year has enrolled more than 180 students. So we've seen a lot of growth there. Um, I think it's also worth noting, however, that the university has reported a, a slightly higher number of withdrawals this spring compared to last year. That's across the university as a whole. And in the School of Public Health, we don't have the official count of withdrawals available. Um, but at first glance, it seems that we're not seeing the same um, withdrawal trend in, this, in the school. Um, so I, just as Dana gave a shout out, I'd also like, like to give a shout out as a huge appreciation to our instructors and, and teaching assistants and our advisors who worked really hard to um, try to continue to create community and keep students engaged, but additionally our IT and our tech staff who have been amazing in smoothing the way for all of us to be able to continue to teach and, and to learn um, and allowing us uh, to sort of transfer our courses online in a way that I wasn't sure was actually possible. So thank you for that. Not without some bumps and bruises, but um, along the way, but it was a great learning process so far. And I am compiling successes um, and also challenges, I suppose, but a lot of people want to talk to us about what works well, knowing that we have a number of very large classes and smaller seminars. We have undergraduate and master's level and, and PhD level um, students that we're working with. So if you have something that's working really well in your courses as a, as a teaching assistant or a student or a faculty, um, send them to me or we can schedule a time to chat because I'd love to hear more about what is working well, especially if this is um, something that will continue into the future. So thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Lisa, do you have any research updates for us? I do. Um, First off, I want to remind everyone um, that the Population Health Initiative COVID-19 Rapid Response Grants are due tomorrow. Um, the deadline is midnight. Um, and um, for those of you who aren't familiar with these, they're for relatively small, short duration projects. Um, Population Health Initiative is providing up to $20,000. Um, and the School of Public Health, as well as some of our departments in the school um, are committing um, to matching funds. Um, we've had great response to this. Um, we've had over, as of just an hour ago, over 20 uh, faculty in the School of Public Health uh, who've put together proposals. Um, you still have until tomorrow at midnight uh, to put your proposal in, um, if at all possible. Uh, we'd love to get your request for matching um, by five today so we can make sure that you get your confirmation um, before you have to turn in your application. Um, and uh, just send your request um, directly to me. 
Um, I've been talking uh, actually for a couple of weeks now about uh, the UW policy on uh, the ability to continue to charge salaries to research grants um, while projects have had to be halted uh, due to COVID-19. Um, and this guidance actually just came out. It actually came out right as the webinar was beginning. Um, we'll we'll um, be in touch with um, some more details about this um, as we disseminate it, um, but it does um, uh, go through a tiered approach, much as um, the advice that we've um, been giving since the beginning, which is, you know, assume that when you can, people should be working on grant-related activities that can be performed remotely. Um, if that's not possible, the next step is really to see if um, we can find some other funded projects uh, to support people. And then in only exceptional cases, should we really be thinking about continuing to charge um, salaries on grants while people aren't able to work on them. Um, NIH has actually allowed for this. Um, and so um, please make sure that you are communicating with your sponsor. Um, and keep in mind that um, to date, we have not had any guarantees that um, salary money expended now would be made up later in, in the form of supplemental funding. That might happen, um, but we don't have any guarantees that that will happen. Um, so just something to consider as investigators are weighing this. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to let you know that we've created a new page um, on the SPH COVID-19 website that has um, kind of all in one place this information about research impacts. It includes um, both the impacts to ongoing studies as well as funding opportunities for COVID-19 related studies. Um, it's designed to be very um, simple and succinct with just key information that you might need. Um, so the, the link to that will be um, included in the um, written summary of uh, the updates that we all provided today. Um, and that's it. Okay. And Jeff actually just added the link to that research page in the chat box as well. Um, so if people want to check it there, um, it's available. Okay. So now we turn to the point in our program where we start answering questions. Um, so the first one is from an anonymous attendee um, and actually is related to the third one, also from perhaps a different or the same anonymous attendee about how do we know how many people in the United States or anywhere um, have been infected with COVID-19, um, particularly given that our testing has been very limited and um, so, you know, you probably see in news reports people talking about we're only releasing the tip of the iceberg because um, uh, at least here we've been prioritizing testing for people who have um, who have uh, symptoms, who are symptomatic. Um, that means that they're all those people are asymptomatic or who just weren't able to access testing um, that they weren't tested, um, but we might not know about them. Um, and so could it be that like the majority of our population has actually already been exposed? And so the answer to that is um, twofold. One is that um, whereas the testing that we've had available to date um, was for testing, um, it's a PCR-based test to test whether or not people are currently infected with COVID-19, as of April 2nd, uh, the FDA had approved an antibody has approved an antibody based test, um, which allows us to see whether or not people were previously infected um, with COVID-19. So, um, and when we have enough um, studies coming out about the immunology to have a sense of um, how long it takes for people to seroconvert and um, to show up as positive in the antibody based test. Um, but that's a really important tool for us to have in our toolbox because it allows us to answer those questions like what percentage of the population um, were infected and didn't even know about it. Um, so um, those tests are not yet wi widely available, um, but you should see um, um, 
requests from our governor and from other governors and from the federal government um, to expand both types of testing capacity, both to uncover people who are currently infected and then people who were previously infected. Um, and of course, it's the combination of those two testing capabilities that will give us the most complete picture. Um, that being said, um, the, the estimates that I've seen from reputable sources um, suggest that um, so if the number of people who are known to be to have been tested and to have a positive test in the state of Washington is like 0.015% of the population. Um, we don't expect that 80% of the population um, has been exposed. We think that, you know, given that the tip of the iceberg, the rest of the iceberg might be as high as like 2% of the population, um, but there's still a lot of people, the vast majority of people, at least here and in states that were very successful at flattening the curve like us, um, who will continue to be um, immunologically uh, naive and would benefit dramatically from having a vaccine. So vaccine is still a super high priority. Um, we also, you know, are still wondering whether or not COVID will start circulating um, seasonally uh, around the globe, in which case it would be really great to have a vaccine for, um, for, future, um, for future incarnations of, of COVID coming back to us. Or um, also because such a large percentage of the population um, has not been exposed at this point. Um, we, we also, some of the models suggest, uh, the vast majority of the models suggest that if we lift up too soon on those social distancing constraints that we could see a resurgence of cases um, and vaccines would obviously be super helpful in terms of um, protecting those individuals um, during a resurgence. So definitely super high priority. Uh, you're not hearing about it as much this week as you are about testing. That's because right now, in order for us to be able to start to go back to work and reopen, lift up some of those um, social distancing constraints that we have under stay home, stay healthy, we need to have the testing capacity to be able to be confident um, that we know who's um, infected and that as we have travelers cases start coming in from other parts um, that are still experiencing the pandemic, other parts of the United States and the world that are still experiencing the pandemic that we can pick those people up and quarantine them and their contacts appropriately. So that's why you're getting a lot of news right now of like, we need to quickly ramp up testing capacity um, and our ability to um, do large scale um, case um, contact tracing. Um, but it's not because we don't want a vaccine. We definitely do. That's just much farther down the road. That's probably a year to a year and a half away unless we get super lucky. Um, okay, next question, actually just a point from Dana, thank you for letting us know, um, that IHME um, posted a note on social media um, just recently, um, like just in the last hour, saying that they're delaying their update of their, their uh, model until tomorrow. Womp womp. So anyway, um, check it tomorrow, because um, I hear it's gonna be a big update. Um, okay, answer the question about, we do have now have antibody-based tests, it's just, they're just not widely available yet, but hopefully that'll change. Um, okay, some, uh, and a more general question about updates on potential treatments. I do not have updates on that. We have, there are a number of clinical trials that are underway, including uh, one by our own faculty member, uh, Ruan Barnabas, who um, spoke two weeks ago on the webinar um, about the clinical trials that, that she was launching. Um, you know, it takes a while for those trials to conclude. We're really looking to see whether or not under, you know, well-controlled um, circumstances that we um, can see whether or not um, any drugs are really efficacious. So I, it'll take a little while for, for that information to come out as well. Um, also, obviously, something that we all care about passionately. Um, it's just a little bit longer time frame than the ramp up of our testing capacity. So that's why you're hearing about testing capacity stuff right now. Um, okay. Some questions about us here at the University of Washington and specifically in the School of Public Health. 
So um, an on, another anonymous attendee said, when you said there are expenses or projects that may be delayed for a couple of years until the economy is more solid, can you please be more specific about what that might mean and what kinds of things would be on hold? So great question. So um, very specifically, um, the things that we are putting on hold um, for right now are extensive faculty hiring. Um, so for, um, for our unit and for most units on campus, um, the one of the largest expenses that we have is um, faculty salary um, and um, particularly faculty with tenure but also faculty who are um, not tenured or who are in WTRF or other series that, that we care about deeply we feel a strong commitment to them um, to make sure that they are whole and so um, at this point we are focused trying to sort of not add to um, beyond what is absolutely necessary to those type of responsibilities so that we have the bandwidth to be able to support the people that we currently have, both faculty and staff. Uh, so the, the main thing in terms of what are we putting on hold, that sort of if there are new areas that people were hoping to grow in our institution, um, if, um, you know, perhaps even some of the retirement replacements, we may need to put those on hold um, in the short term, those hires on hold, um, and so that we can make sure that we're financially in a really sound position. So that's the main one. Um, I haven't heard of other sort of like programmatic areas um, that, that the university is considering um, to put on hold, uh, just in general that um, we are expecting that there may be budget cuts um, coming from in terms of state support. Um, and so we're all trying to be um, as careful as possible about not taking on additional new um, burdens. Um, okay, question from Megan, who says, if the return to work action happens prior to late June, what might that look like for us knowing that public schools are out until the end of the school year and summer camp may, camps may not be operational. Yeah, so lots of uncertainty around this area. Um, and we're expecting to hear a lot more information um, in the next week or two as um, the plans that our governor and the governors of Oregon and Washington, their plans start to be released um, as the CDC's planning documents start to be released. Um, so um, in general, we're sort of saying, hang in there. We're expecting, you know, there to be a lot of uh, new information um, and a, a lot to sort of take in and figure out how to implement that in terms of our own plans coming over the next week or two. Um, that being said, Megan, I want to reassure you um, that just because um, the, the current restrictions uh, so right now under um, the governor's stay home, stay healthy policy, only those individuals who um, are able to work safely on campus and who are working in functions that are critical um, and require someone to be on campus are supposed to be working on campus. Um, so if that restriction was lifted, it doesn't mean that people have to work on campus. It just means that uh, that people would more people would be allowed to work on campus, um, and so I think it's really important to keep in mind that um, we have considerable flexibility both as an institution and within our own organization to uh, make sure that we are being humane and considerate and flexible um, in terms of dealing with um, the people that we supervise. Um, in terms of recognizing the really um, significant constraints that everybody faces. Um, and childcare is a big one of those constraints. So, um, since I'm your supervisor, Megan, I can say to you, hey, that's not a problem because if you still have a kid at home, I'm your supervisor, you'd talk to me and I'd say, of course it makes sense if you have a kid at home that you continue to work remotely. Um, for those of you that I don't personally supervise, those are conversations you need to have with your supervisors. But I guess I would say rest assured um, that we are certainly messaging out to supervisors that 
um, you know, to make sure that we're the policies that they're um, falling through on are um, respectful of the fact that we value our our employees um, and the people in our community as human beings and recognize that um, this is a really complicated and unprecedented situation and pretty darn stressful for most people. Um, so, so we will be looking out for those things. Um, and we encourage supervisors to talk to the HR managers if they have concerns about as things start to shift, um, how to implement those. Um, that reminds me um, that in general, um, someone asked me to, um, actually a couple people did, to um, remind supervisors, um, and I would say this goes for instructors as well, that a lot of people are um, in situations that are really complicated in terms of, for instance, having small kids at home who in theory are taking, you know, has school um, online, but for most kids, that's a you know, really hard thing for them to do on their own, if at all. And so um, parents are trying to, you know, juggle helping their kids and keeping their kids in a good place, both psychologically and occupied, and trying to do their own work tasks. Um, we are in a community where um, many of us are, are pretty driven, self-driven, and have pretty high expectations for ourselves. Um, and so it's a really hard thing to sort of step back and say the kind of productivity that I expect to have under normal circumstances probably is not going to be possible for most people um, under the current circumstances. And so please be kind to yourself, um, but also supervisors, do what you can to message that out to the people who are working for you that, you know, go and look at the kind of projects that people have, if they're projects that can be pushed back delayed or even not done, um, help, help the people that you supervise to prioritize which things need to get done um, right now and which things maybe could be postponed or, or pushed to the back burner. Okay, on a similar note, um, someone asked, of course, we know the situation is still very dynamic and in flux, um, but at this point, how likely do we think it, it is that there may still be, uh, that we may still be remote for autumn classes? So great question and one that the deans asked the provost this morning in our board of deans and chancellors meeting. Um, so I will echo to you uh, the message that he gave to us, um, which is that on the one hand, we're really lucky that we're on quarters. Um, usually it doesn't feel like it for most people. You sort of go, why are we on quarters when everyone else is on semesters? But this is one time when it's really to our advantage, which is that we aren't starting in mid-August. We're not starting until the end of September. So um, uh, we, we will be starting at the end of September, as we always do. Um, and so that buys us some time. Um, we do expect a lot of things to change um, between now and closer to September, and um, that we will start to have more complete guidance in the next week or two, but also that we'll know a whole lot more in June that, about what's likely to happen in the fall than we do right now. So um, we are, you know, usually I'm the one who's like, let's just make a decision and stick with it. And this particular case, it really behooves us to, you know, bide our time a little bit um, to see whether we might be able to start in person in the fall. Um, however, we all, all are having conversations about, you know, if there are individuals who can't make fall because of travel restrictions, if we do end up offering in-person options, um, or um, if there are people who, because of personal vulnerabilities, aren't able to um, attend classes in person, how are we going to accommodate those folks? So I would just sort of reassure you that as the leadership team, we're, we're sort of looking at all those different issues. We'll be talking with instructors about how to sort of best prepare for the fall, um, given those uncertainties, and um, we will continue to let you guys know um, sort of where we are in that decision-making process, but I'd say hang tight in terms of fall. Um, we're trying to sort of wait until we have good information that might allow us to make a better decision. Um, okay, a uh, really nice comment from Barbara Richardson who says, UW Virology's first set of validation tests for the antibody testing look good, woo -hoo! And uh, they say they may be, off, be able to offer clinical testing for thousands per day as soon as next week. So that's super awesome news. 
Um, very excited to hear that. Um, Chuck reports, there was a report in the media about a toxicologist who reported that some of the deaths from patients on ventilators might be dying from carbon monoxide poisoning because introducing more oxygen into their lungs under stress produces more carbon monoxide. And due to the binding property of carbon monoxide, more carbon monoxide will bind to the blood. Have you seen anything on this? And is anyone looking to verify it? I have not heard of that, but I appreciate you letting me know, Chuck, and let me know, shoot me an email, because um, if you can find that media report, I'd, I'd love to look into it and, and see if there's more on that. Um, and then a question from another anonymous attendee who says they're a PhD student in the school who's currently unemployed, um, that they pursued RA and TA positions, but they didn't secure any positions for the entire 1920 academic year um, and have been living off of savings as they maintain their part-time enrollment. Um, I'm at the point where if there were not a pandemic with widespread unemployment, I would start applying for various jobs, including even in the service industry. However, these jobs are very limited and seem risky. I'd like advice on where I might look for part-time position at UW or in public health this spring. Um, I'm interested in specific staff positions in SPH, which is grant funded, but when might these type of hires be allowed? Are any additional funding sources for surveillance um, going to be likely to provide employment? for contact tracing, et cetera. And although that person did complete the survey indicating interest in volunteering at the health department with open availability, um, has not heard back about that. Okay, lots of stuff there. So first of all, I am so sorry to hear um, about the, the challenges that you've been facing. Um, please do contact Janet Basement. So her contact information is in the chat box um, to follow up about health department stuff. We also, and specifically let her know that you're also looking for employment um, because we have also been trying to communicate to um, our local uh, practice partners about when we have individuals who are actually interested in employment opportunities um, as opposed to just volunteer uh, opportunities. Um, we do not have a hiring freeze on grants that are COVID related. So those grants are still we don't have a hiring freeze period, but we are not restricting hiring in any way, shape or form on grants that are COVID related. Um, so those we're still trying to push through as much as we can. Um, and so um, there, Lisa, are you the best person to contact about that? Or are, we had talked uh, about sort of having a clearinghouse for that information. Yeah, we haven't um, put together a clearinghouse yet for that information. So, okay. and I think most of the COVID related new grants, um, we haven't seen a lot of them come online yet. We've seen lots of applications. Okay. Um, so I know it's not fun to be told to kind of sit tight and wait until you hear someone yeah. for a position. But at, at right now today, um, unfortunately, that's where we're at. And we'll continue to look at ways to link people who need things to investigators who have a need for personnel. Okay. And I would say also send your information to Stephanie and or Juanita, um, because um, we're, um, um, so, okay, so Chris said it's not a COVID related grant. So, non-COVID related grants where people can work remotely, they are still allowed to hire people. Um, it just may be slowed down because we're sort of prioritizing pushing through COVID stuff, but it should be possible to do that hiring if the money is there. Um, but send your information to Stephanie and Juanita because then if we hear of other opportunities that come up, um, you'll be on our radar screen. And in general, we definitely, students who are experiencing difficulties please do reach out to obviously your own student affairs staff in your unit, but also Stephanie and Juanita, um, because we, we're in the business of matchmaking at this point, um, and um, we are happy to help you. Um, okay. Wow, did we get through all the questions? Amazingly enough, I think we have gotten through all the questions so far. Um, all right. Well, guys, for, we're actually finishing five minutes early. I give you back 
the most valuable gift, the gift of time, albeit only five minutes. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Huge thanks to Betty um, for coming and telling us about what's going on in um, the Northwest Center. And um, just, you know, wishes to all of you to stay um, healthy and well. Um, and um, to the extent that you can stay positive, please get out there and, and enjoy some of that beautiful sunshine, just staying six feet apart from people. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, this is a long haul. It has been a long haul already, but we still have quite a bit ahead of us um, and including a lot of uncertainty. So be kind to yourselves, be kind to um, the people that you love and the people that you work with. And uh, we'll see all of you guys next week. Bye-bye.